Good evening, church family, and welcome to Rivers of Life Wednesday night Bible study. I'm Reverend Glenn Hand, and it is my great honor and blessing to be uh, continuing in, in the Psalms, in our uh, teaching and learning of the Psalms, the importance and the beauty of the Psalms. And we'll be in Psalm 45 and 46 this evening. Uh, and we'll be looking at, uh, well, in Psalm 45, we're going to be looking at the church as a bride. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very unique psalm, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And in Psalm 46, uh, we're going to be talking about war. So uh, we have no announcements this evening, so let's go to the throne of grace, and we'll get right to the work. Father God, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy, all your blessings seen and unseen. And on this evening, I ask that you use me as a willing vessel to deliver your word in your way and have the Holy Spirit truly be the teacher on this evening. Move me aside and have your Holy Spirit do the teaching and have our listeners and our viewers not only hear the word, but ingest the word into their being and into their spirits and have it inform their actions in the world as Christians representing you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And we do give thanks. Amen and amen again. Now, Psalm 45, the Psalms are, the Psalms are just great. There's such a variety of, of how they present uh, God to us, how they present ourselves to us. Uh, and Psalm 45 is, is truly unique in the Psalms because uh, this is a, it's a wedding feast of a king. Uh, it, it is not addressed to God. It is describing a wedding. It's describing the wedding of a leader, describing the, letter, uh, the wedding of a king. And uh, it's usually interpreted, and I think quite uh, correctly, it's usually interpreted uh, for us as Christians as representative of uh, not only Jesus' incarnation, uh, but I want to talk about uh, the church and the church being a bride, and also as the church being considered feminine. Uh, sometimes uh, we don't think about that, but the church is presented as a bride. And, uh, and as this psalm unfolds, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that and what that means to us uh, as Christians. So verse 1 begins this way, as it describes this scene. It says, my heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king, and my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So the, the psalmist is, is describing himself as the writer, and he's very ready to do his job. He's very ready to describe uh, the coronation, and the, not the coronation, but the wedding of this king to his bride. Uh, coronation, uh, I don't know why I keep saying coronations, but weddings, royal weddings, in fact, Oh, very important in the ancient world, and even in the modern world, they try to be made to be important as well. Uh, but in the ancient world, the, the wedding of a king to his bride was a, uh, was a national uh, spectacle. It was 
uh, of great importance because the king, uh, whether it was a Judea king or, or, or a king outside of uh, Judaism, or as we got into the Christian era, kings were representatives, were thought to be representatives of God on earth, divine uh, representation. And it was important to the nations to have uh, the wedding of a king and a queen to be the pinnacle, to be the ideal of uh, uh, representing not only God, but representing the country and the world. So this writer is saying that I'm going to do this to the best of my ability because it has this great importance. So verse 2 says, you are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. So this is the qualities of, uh, of the king, what the king should bring uh, to the fore as a leader. He should be truthful. He should be humble, and he should be righteous. And this righteousness does come from God. Verse 5 says this, Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, and the peoples fall under you. So he is going to be a defender of the people. The king defends the country. He is, he is the bulwark. He, he is the buffer between what is dangerous, what is harmful, uh, what could be destructive. Uh, to the country, he is that he is that intermediary. He is that thing in between that keeps order and doesn't allow chaos. Verse six and seven. They're uh, both interesting. We're, we're going to talk a bit about them. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Now, these two particular scriptures uh, kind of bring us into uh, the incarnation of Jesus, because there's a parallel that we're going to find here in the book of Hebrews. If we look at Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And in chapter 1, the author of Hebrews is using, exclusively throughout chapter 1, uh, different snippets of scriptures from the Old Testament to, to make the argument and the case that Jesus was foretold in the Old Testament. He uses several uh, uh, verses from the Hebrew Bible, from the Old Testament. Uh, and in verse 8 and 9, he actually quotes directly from, from our psalm this, more, uh, this evening, verse, uh, Psalm 45. Verse 8, he says, but to the Son. So he says, but to the Son. So in other words, the author of Hebrews is saying, God is talking about Jesus when the psalmists and when the prophets have written these certain things. So, so he's saying, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness. You hated law lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. That is a word-for-word -word, uh, quotation directly from the Psalms. And, 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 and I think or uh, in my reading and in, in my studying to to uh, to teach tonight, in my mind, this kind of makes the transition uh, of this being about just about any king, about some because we don't know who the king is. We're assuming it's a Davidic king. Uh, it may be, it may not be. It doesn't matter. Uh, I think this this transition in verse six and seven, which is then quoted word for word in, in the New Testament, in Hebrews, it, it, speaking about Jesus specifically, uh, gives us a, tr a transition to Jesus, not only his incarnation, our salvation through his incarnation, his crucifixion, uh, but also as the bridegroom of the church. 
And, and so let's go on because there, there's kind of more to come. Uh, verse 8 says this, All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. Nothing but the best for kings, right? Uh, verse 9 says, King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Now here is the bride. And, and he's going to now, the psalmist is now going to describe the bride of the king. And now I want you to think about the church being the bride of Christ. And the church uh, being thought of, being presented in, in, in the Bible. And talked about as feminine. Uh, so verse 10, we're going to transition to uh, focusing away from the king and onto his bride. Verse 10 says, listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. Forget your own people. Uh, the thought here is, in a marriage, you're leaving the groom and the bride, or the bride and the groom, are leaving something behind. They're leaving their families behind. And they're saying, so the psalmist says here, forget to the bride, forget your own people, forget them. When we get saved, when we make the decision of salvation. When we come to the realization, we get to a point in our lives that we can no longer see our lives with us in charge, where we need to submit to God and we need to give ourselves to Christ in order to go on because everything we do leads to dead ends and to bad ends. And we have to forget our own people. We have to forget the people that we had been around, the people that we spent our time with, the people that we considered family. And I'm not talking about blood relatives, although that may be. And I thought about my own experience uh, of being saved and, and the company that I kept uh, in all those years, for all those years. And I had to forget those people. I had to leave that people. I had to leave that community and come to a new community. And those transitions were difficult because, as Pastor has taught in the past, something has to die in us. Uh, we have to kill off some things. And, and, and as we get saved, as we become part of the church, as we become part of the bride, we become the bride. Right? Uh, and submit to God, uh, we have to leave those things behind us. Uh, the church's bride is mentioned several times in, in the New Testament. Uh, I want to turn to John chapter 3. Uh, we're talking about submitting, uh, not only submitting, but admitting, admitting that we are powerless. And uh, in chapter 3 of John, verse 29 and verse 30, uh, John is approached by uh, some of his followers who have been approached by some other uh, people, and, and they're conflicted over who John is in, in some way. And, uh, and, and John says, I'm not the Christ. He actually said in, in John John's gospel, he says that. I'm not the Christ, right? He's saying, I am not that. Verse 29, he says this, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. And he's talking specifically about Jesus. But the friend of the bridegroom, that's, he's referring to himself there, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. And then he says, uh, a verse that I have said to myself many times, and I continue to say to myself many times, and I'm sure many of you do as well. Verse 30, he says, He, Jesus, must increase, 
but I must decrease. And when we turn to God, and when we admit that we can no longer do this on our own, right? We can no longer traverse this world in the haphazard way that we have been in the past. Uh, we have to leave our people behind, forget our people. And what John is saying, I have to forget who I am. Remember, John is, is a successful, uh, has a, a large following. He's successful as a baptizer. He is a preacher. He's a teacher. And he has a following. Uh, and he has to admit that he's not the one. And he has to tell others, I am not the one. When he baptizes Jesus, and he, which he doesn't want to, he says, I'm not worthy. But Jesus says, no, this is the right way to do this. And he baptizes Jesus. But here, John has to say, I have to decrease. So Jesus can increase. Well, we have to decrease. And we have to forget some things. And we have to forget our people. The people that we no longer need to be around. And we need to be around new people. Uh, so Jesus is the bridegroom here. The church, us, you, and me, doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, we're the brides. We are part of the church, right? Uh, verse 11 says this. So the king will greatly desire your beauty. God wants us because he's your Lord. Worship him. And the daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. Verse 13 says, The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought forth to the king in robes of many colors. Colors the virgins, her companions who follow her shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. Verse 16, instead your fathers shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. So now, talking about the next generation, right? We're talking about the church as being feminine, the church as being uh, the bride, right? And we are part of the church. Well, what does, what does the feminine represent? It represents birth. Regeneration. That is what the church is to do. Is to regenerate. It's to bring forth birth. We are born again. Right? But not only are we born again, we are to have others be born again. We are to have others to regenerate. Generation after generation after generation. That is why the church is considered a bride. And Jesus is the bridegroom. <clears throat> Finally, before we go to the last two verses, I'd like to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. And that says this. One final example of how the Bible talks about how we, not only how husbands should relate to wives, but how we should relate to the church and how we should relate to God, how we should relate to Jesus as the groom, the, the bridegroom of the church. And verse 25 says this, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water, by the word. So we are to love our wives, but here Jesus says is to love us, right? As he's the groom, he's the bridegroom, we're the bride, the church is the bride, he's to love us. And he does love us. And he sacrificed everything for us. And once we realize that and we submit ourselves to that and we humble ourselves to that and, and admit humbly that we cannot do this on our own, 
That's the, our pride is, is, is the biggest stumbling block I, I think that we face each and every day. And we'll kind of talk a bit about the internal battles that we have in Psalm 46. But our pride always trips us up. That is the biggest stumbling block for a Christian because it is hard for us to be humble. And Jesus calls us to be humble. The bridegroom calls us to be humble as he was humble. He was God. He submitted to being human. There is no God in any of the mythology of any of the ancient Greeks or Romans or Sumerians or Babylonians. There is, there is no uh, mythology that has a God actually becoming human. They may take human form, but they never become human. Jesus becomes human in every sense of the word. That's humbling for a God to become human. And that, not only that, he submits to death and death on a cross which is how criminals were executed. And he did that for us. That is the example that we are to live. We are to humble ourselves. And it's difficult because we have pride. It's in us. It's ingrained. It's the daily battle that we have. When we are born again, the the Greek words that are translated born again in John are the Greek words geneo and othen. And a better, geneo has to do with birth, right? We get the word genesis comes from it, right? Birth. Genes. And othen really strictly, uh, literally means from above. So not only are we born again, right, but we're born from above, not from here, right? Uh, And that's what we pursue. That's the pursuit of something better. And it's humbling because we have to admit that we can't do it without God. And we have to do that each and every day, each and every moment sometimes of days, especially when we're under pressure and in the world that we live in. Read the headlines or hear the headlines or have someone bark them at you over the internet. There's chaos in our world each and every day. It seems that uh, whether it's in the halls of the Congress or in the Supreme Court or in the streets, it seems that we are just moments away from chaos. It is a world full of tension that we have to deal with and we have to learn how to deal with it humbly and that's difficult for us but that's our quest as diligent seekers right diligent seekers and the hebrews talks about diligent seekers as well uh verse 16 and 17 to finish up psalm 45 instead of your fathers shall be your sons whom you shall make princes in all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered in all generations, in all generations. And we are to have God's name be remembered in all our generations, to our sons, to our daughters, to our grandchildren, to our great-grandchildren, to our siblings, to everyone that we can speak to. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be about how our words how we evangelize with words, but how we act, how we react to things, that people see us. Because we are observed as Christians. We're observed all the time. Uh, And we're representing the bridegroom. And we can either bring shame or exaltation, depending on how we humble ourselves and how we act and react. All right, let's turn to Psalm 46. And Psalm 46 is a much different type of psalm. Uh, it is, uh, uh, has a much different tenor. It's talking about a different subject uh, altogether. It is uh, talking about conflict. And I think it's apropos to, to come on the heels of, of 
what we just read and talked about in, in Psalm 45. Psalm 46 begins this way. Oh, and before I begin, uh, Psalm 46, uh, this is just some trivial knowledge that uh, you might be on Jeopardy some night. Uh, this was the inspiration for Martin Luther to uh, write the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Uh, so if, if they ask you that, uh, you could be the winner on Jeopardy some night. If not, if not uh, you just learned something you didn't know, and you could forget it in five minutes. Uh, verse 1 says this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. So not only pride is a problem with us, but fear. Fear is definitely a problem. We are afraid of a lot of things, and sometimes rightly so. Uh, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, even though these great tremblings happen within our lives, these great uh, upheavals within our lives, which, which happen, uh, sometimes more regularly uh, than other times, but they happen. And, and who do we turn to? And how do we react in those times? Verse 3 says this, Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. I welcome you to Rivers of Life Church Ministries. I'll read that again. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Uh, that is woven into the heart and the spirit of Rivers of Life Church Ministries. Uh, they probably won't ask you that on Jeopardy, but Pastor might ask you that someday. So be prepared. Psalm 46, verse 4. Verse 5 says this, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. And the earth melted. So God is our defense even when the earth is moved, even when there is chaos in the land. He is our refuge and our strength. In the ancient world, we talked about the king in, in, in Psalm 45, and we talked about the king being this buffer uh, between chaos and, and, and calm, keeping order, keeping the city safe, keeping the people safe. In the ancient world, any major city, was walled, and the wall was high and manned uh, by usually archers and military people to keep the city safe. But even the strongest of walls in the ancient world would fall to a greater foe, to a stronger foe. Rome, for example, breached many of a wall. Uh, but what the psalmist is saying here, those walls can fall. But the walls that God provides for us, they won't fall if we have faith. We have to believe. If we put our trust in God, if we humble ourselves before God, he will lift us up. He will change our hearts and our minds, and he will give us the strength to get through the difficulties of life. And Jesus guarantees that there's going to be tribulations in your life. He doesn't sugarcoat it at all. But there's a way, there's a method, there's a system in place that we can use. It's at our disposal. And we might mess up today, but we can clean ourselves up tomorrow. Now, you don't want to be doing that on a regular basis. You want your faith to expand. You want it to strengthen. And you want to have a spiritual memory that remembers what God has done for you before God will do again. And if it doesn't work out the way you want it, God is still good and is with you. 
God's not absent. Verse 5 and verse 6 talked about, talks about God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just as the, uh, at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. God's not absent. All right? That's what those, when I read those verses, uh, I hope you can uh, come, uh, uh, make that connection in your head. God's not absent. God is always present. We forget he's there. Or we turn our backs. God's not sleeping. We are. And we have, that's what we have to fight each and every day. Uh, verse 7, let's go on. The Lord of hosts is with us. Again, he's ever-present. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and the cuts and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in fire. And when I read those three verses from those two verses, eight and nine, uh, it, for some reason, uh, it brought to mind the uh, the idea of Armageddon. And this, this final battle, right, that takes place at the end of days. Uh, and, and what's the purpose of, of that battle? I started thinking about, what, well, what's the purpose of that battle? You know, we, we talk about it, we uh, teach it, we, we can believe it literally. Uh, but what does it mean? What does it actually mean? What's actually happening there? What's the point? If God is to do this, why is God doing this? And it's the site of the end times battle, this end time battle, where the goodness of God defeats the darkness of evil. But what about a spiritual Armageddon? What about an internal battleground? What about the battleground that resides in us, you know, uh, and I've kind of been around this all evening, this, this idea of this tension within us, uh, the things from without, the chaos, the turmoil, the things that we read in the headlines, the things that we hear on the news, the things that people talk about on, in, in the shopping, in the stores, uh, people that we bump into. And uh, everyone has opinions, and they seem to be very widely dispersed. And uh, we seem to be very, very much divided. Uh, and in this chaos, just, just aside from the normal desires of humans <laughs> and weaknesses and fallacy, uh, uh, faults that we have, uh, there's this internal struggle, this internal Armageddon. This, this, where our final battles are, are taking place, where, how do we defeat our darkness? Because we're so, we can be in a world like it is today, and like it's always been. Don't think we're so special. Uh, how do we win this internal battle, this Armageddon? How do, how do we defeat this darkness that we have with us? Well, I think we have a series of battles every day. It's not, we're not going to win the war. Not here, not yet, and we can't win it anyway. We need God to win it. But how, how do we look at it? How do we approach it? How, how do we remain consistent? Consistency is the thing. How, how do we, how do we, everybody talks about sustainability these days, you know? Uh, is this sustainable? Is that sustainable? Well, how is, how is this sustainable in us, this internal battle, this internal Armageddon where the goodness of God in us has to constantly fight and defeat the darkness of evil that resides in us? And, and, and you and I, there's none of us so holy, all right? So let's, let's get that straight right now, all right? There's none of us so holy that we don't have these struggles within us. We don't fall short each and every day. But I want to take a, a quick look at uh, Romans 7. 
And I know I've turned a lot this evening. I usually don't do this, but it's what God put on my heart. Uh, Romans chapter 7. Uh, we're going to look at verses 19 and 20, but before we do, uh, Paul is talking, and, and Romans, and, and if you, and, and make time, okay, I'm not going to, make time to read Romans. Romans is, is I, I, Corinthians 1 and 2 is great, uh, all the pastoral, they're all good, There's, yes, yes. Uh, but Romans is a uh, is, is written like a legal treatise on, on on how to be a Christian and the inner conflicts that we that we struggle with as Christians as well. It's 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 wonderfully written. Uh, it's brilliantly written. And Paul here in verse in, in chapter seven, he's talking about what he wants to do. Right? He's actually talking about the law and how insufficient the law is. The law only points out your sin and it doesn't bring you to salvation, as Christ does. And what he's saying is, he's going to he's going to cop to his humility, and to his inner Armageddon, hit the conflict and the tension within him, and we can all identify with it, and we should, <clears throat> because it's us, right? As we go through this book, right, whether it's the Psalms or and just open a page, right, it's about us. And it's for us. So he's having this conflict, and he's trying to point out that the law can't help you be a better person because we are conflicted in ourselves. And he talks about himself. He doesn't point fingers about anybody else. He talks about himself here. And in verse 19, he says this. For the good that I will to do, the thing that I want to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. So what I want to do, I want to do good, but I can't seem to do it. And the evil that I don't want to do, that, that those, those things that I don't want to participate in, those things I don't want to say behind people's backs, the, the way I don't want to act, that I do. Verse 20, he says, now, if I do what I will not to do, so if I'm doing the things that I don't want to do, it's no longer I that does it. It's no longer I who do it. But sin that dwells in me and there. Shakespeare would say, I, there's the rub. All right? There's, it is the presence of missing the mark, right, in us, because we miss the mark. We are never, ever on our own pure. That's just, doesn't happen. That doesn't happen here. It happens when we leave here. If if, and only if, and I'm trying to page my way back to Psalm 45, 46 rather, uh, it's if and only if we remain humble. If and only if we are uh, pursuing God, we are diligent seekers. This is a process and not an event. I say that often, but it's true. This is a process and it's not an event. We don't all of a sudden get saved and uh, Janeo... And nothing born from above, and everything is solved. We're good. I'm never going to sin again. God's got me. I'm always going to be this perfect person. I'm a Christian now. Look at me. No. Mm -mm. All of us fall short each and every day. Paul writes about that as well. The things that I want to do, the good that I want to do, I can't do. And the evil that I don't want to do, that I do. And it's not the law. It's not keeping commandments, although we should. Diligent seekers. But it's the forgiveness and the blood of Jesus. It is that act and our belief in that act that makes us worthy. We, on our own, are never holy enough. Never pure enough. And our pride prevents us from realizing that sometimes. 
And for some of us, it is a constant stumbling block. And it's something we have to deal with. It's something we have to, and the only way to deal with it, the only, for me, okay, I'll speak about myself right now. The only way that I can deal with this is each and every day I start my day with God, and that's it. I consistently do that, and I still mess up. But I do it each and every day. And I can look over the arc of 18 years, and I'm a much better person than I was 18 years ago. But I'm not perfect, and I never will be perfect. And that's what we have to understand as Christians. We're not perfect. We never can be perfect. We don't have... We don't have the holiness to look down on anyone else. We should be lifting up and not putting down with our words and our actions. That's our goal, always. Right? We're going to mess up, but we get up. Keep getting up. Verse 10 says this. And we'll end up with 10 and 11. And this is great advice right here. This is God speaking to us. Be still. In other words, shut it up. Be still and know that I am God. Not you. I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. God's not absent. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And that, my friends, that is where we put our trust. That is where we put all our marbles, right? What's that old saying? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, that's the basket I'm putting all my eggs in. I used to be a pretty big gambler. And like most gamblers, I lost more than I won. But right now, this isn't a gamble. This is a sure thing. And all my, I'm, I'm all in. And you need to be all in. And that's what we do here. That's what God does for us. The opportunities that we get to be good, to do the things that we will to do. See, we can do things that are good. We can do that. We're still going to do things we don't want to do. That's just the humanness of us. That's just us tripping over our pride. It's going to happen. We can repent. And as I always say, repent. Repenting is not when you cry. Repenting is when you change. And all of us have room for change. I know I certainly do. Let's go to the throne of grace. <clears throat> Father God, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for the hearers. We thank you for the listeners. We thank you for this church ministry. I just ask on this evening that your words have gone forth in power and in might. Something that was said this evening will change someone's heart, will change something on the interior, someone who's fighting that battle this evening, this very moment. Someone is fighting that battle inside of themselves, their own personal Armageddon, where they want to defeat evil. They want to do good. And they want to submit to you, Father. So I ask you to bless them, and I pray for them, and I pray for us all. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. And if you are going through your personal Armageddon, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It is the easiest thing there is to do with an open heart, with an open spirit. All you must do is say that, God, I come to you knowing knowing that I've fallen short of your glory each and every day. But I submit to you now. And I believe that your son died on the cross for our salvation. And I also believe further that you raised him from the dead, that life was victorious over death. And life can be victorious over death in my heart. And that internal Armageddon can be won through my service and my belief in you. It's so easy. 
And you don't have to say them in those words. You can simply say, Jesus, come into my heart. And he'll be there. And if you've done that, I welcome you to the Christian community. And if you're close to us, I certainly invite you to Rivers Life Church Ministries. You can contact us, and we have information on your next steps as a Christian. And if you're far from us, or even if you're around the corner, find yourself a church, a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church that can guide you on your way in your new Christian life, being born from above and not below. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us on this evening. I pray that you have a wonderful week, that God continues to bless you and your family. And I hope to see you all this Sunday. Good night and God bless. Thank you for joining today's broadcast. Please visit us on our website at rolcm.org.